And welcome back to Clinical Optics Made Easy. Today we're going to talk about prisms. I'm your narrator, M.N. Wiggins, and we're happy to have you back. On today's uh, Blue Plate Special, we're going to be talking about some laws, some internal reflection. We're going to do lots of experiments that are a whole lot of fun, talk about lots of rules, and then something called tachos. As always, Davis Street would like me to point out that everything that we're going to talk about today can be found in Clinical Optics Made Easy, the second edition. I would advise you to read whatever optics book uh, speaks to you that you can read uh, easily and get the information. You really need to work lots of problems. I know I say that every lecture, but it's so true. The nice thing about this book is that it has lots of problems in it. It has practice tests. It has one big final at the end. It was written in a way that I wanted to have a, an optics book when I was a resident. So everyone has a different opinion on as to what that looks like. This is just my version, but find something that works for you. Work problems, read chapters, and listen to lectures. It is the best way to learn optics. We're going to start off today by discussing or rediscussing Snell's Law. And the first thing I'll point out is that this is the 1621 Dutch astronomer Snell and not the 1862 Dutch ophthalmologist Snellen, the guy that made the big e-chart. So if I haven't convinced you of the importance of Snell's Law and why you should understand it, we're going to show you how it applies to doing MIGs. So I've got an eye here, and what you can see is that we've got the camera angle really tilted, just like you do an operating microscope. And if I have a gonio prism on here, then I'm able to see the angle, and you can see my brown trabecular meshwork right here. And right now, there's just me and air, so there's no change in refractive indices, so I should be able to go directly at that with no problem. But to make sure that I don't cheat, I'm going to use this uh, tube right here, and kind of using a Seldinger technique, I'm going to put my pointer through that tube as if I were putting an instrument through my main wound. And I should be able to go right to that trabecular meshwork with no problem, which I can. Because again, it's just me and air right now. But what we're going to do next is we're going to fill this with water, which has a refractive index just like aqueous, 1.33. And we're going to see if things change. So now I have it filled with water or aqueous. And I'm going to put my pointer right here, my tube, and I'm going to aim it right at where I think the trabecular meshwork is. And then I'm going to put my instrument in there as if I were about to hit the trabecular meshwork to do my MIGS procedure. So here we go. So right now it's hitting the water. It should be going right to that trabecular meshwork. But as you can see, it hits high. So why did that happen? Well, in the first case, where it was all air, there was no change in refractive indices. So everything is where it appears to be. But once I filled it with water, things change. And think about the rays from the trabecular meshwork coming through that water into air before it reached my eye. And so going from high refractive index to the air, the low refractive index, it will bend away from the normal, which is that dotted line, and it bends away with respect to that red undeviated ray. So where was the image from my point of view? It was where the ray comes out. If we draw a virtual line back there, that dotted line, that is where the TM appeared to be through the water, but actually the TM was located inferior to that. So whenever you're doing a MIGS procedure and you're trying to get to that trabecular meshwork, uh, keep Snell's law in mind. Now I have repositioned my camera to where it's directly pointing down at my uh, view of the eye, just as if you had readjusted your microscope to get rid of that angle into its normal position. And so now my goal is to complete my rexus. Uh, and so I'm going to put my utratus through there and try to grab my flap. And let's see if I have the same problem that I did when I was trying to do my MIGS procedure. So here I am. And as you can see, I have no difficulty going right to the edge of my flap. And that's actually the vertical place that I intended to go. Now, why did I not have a problem? Because I'm going again through an interface change of different refractive indices. And so remember the caveat to Snell's law. If we go perpendicular to the interface, we do not go at any other angle, 
then those rays don't bend. And that's exactly what you're doing when you have that microscope in the perpendicular position. And that's why it's so easy when you're in there to grab what you intend to grab. It's not until you put it on an angle because of Snell's Law to do those MIGS procedures that this really comes into play. Ever wonder why we can't see the angle of the eye with the slit lamp? Once again, Snell's Law comes into play here. Let's say that we're going to look at maybe the middle portion of the iris, kind of out in that mid-stroma. And let's say that those rays were coming from that iris, going through the aqueous, they're going to hit the cornea, and then they're going to go out into air. And let's say that they hit that cornea air interface at 40 degrees. And because we're going from high to low, once again, we're going to bend away from the normal with respect to that dotted undeviated ray right there. But the rays do come out, and we can see, as you know, that portion of the iris. Now let's look a little farther to the edge, closer to the angle, but not quite in the angle yet. And you can see that when it hits 43 degrees, that ray is bending even more. And I think you can see that this is about to become a problem. So as we look out further and we're getting closer to the angle of the eye, but we're not quite there, we're still looking at iris, we're going to reach a point that is 46.5 degrees on that interface change between the cornea and air. And this is the tipping point between having a view and not having a view. It's called the critical angle of the cornea air interface. And once you're past that critical angle, you're not going to get a view at all because once we're beyond it, the rays that are hitting the cornea, when they get to that air interface, they bend so much that they go right back into that cornea, back into the eye. They do not go into your eye. So we cannot see the structures of the angle. Uh, even if we have the patient look all the way to one side or we swing the microscope as far as we can, that will not overcome this critical angle problem that we have. The only way that we have is to change the situation. There are a couple different ways we can do that, but what we most commonly do is use a gonio lens, and the way that that works is it has a mirror on it such that it is changing it to less than the critical angle so that we now have at least an indirect view. And all of this is, once again, because of Snell's Law. Now, there is one other thing, which is the topic of this lecture, to where Snell's Law comes into play in a big way. So let's say that we have this innocent looking plastic triangle sitting here, who knows what they're called, and we're going to shoot a ray through it with the red ray there and it's going to exit through that slope and the plastic triangle is, has a refractive index, of, let's say 1.4 or something, and it's going out into air with a refractive index of 1. And we know that because of the slope, because of Snell's law and the change in the refractive index, something's going to happen. It is not going to be that purple ray. It's either going to bend up towards that green ray or bend down towards that yellow ray. And hopefully by now you know which of those two it's going to be. But to figure that out, uh, let's draw a normal. So there's the normal. That's perpendicular to the interface right there. And so we know that going from high to low, it will always bend away from the normal with respect to the undeviated ray. So it must be the yellow ray right there. It turns out that in a triangle, because of the slope where it's exiting, all of the exiting rays will bend the same way. Notice how these rays are not getting closer or farther apart. They're staying the same. They're parallel rays. This is what we call a prism. And because the rays coming out of a prism do not get closer or farther apart from each other, they have no dioptric power. There's no vergence going on here. So you don't have plus and minus prisms. They don't converge rays. They don't diverge rays. All the rays are parallel. Now, how do we define one prism from another? So even though a prism doesn't have any dioptric power, it does have prismatic power. Let's draw the undeviated ray as the dotted line here. And then of course the yellow ray is what's really happening. And now let's draw the vertical distance at a few different points. And here they are. So as you can see, if we decide to name prisms based upon the vertical drop from the horizontal dotted line to where the ray actually is, then it entirely depends upon how far away from the prism we make that measurement. So if we want to standardize uh, what is a six prism diopter prism versus a 20 prism diopter prism, we need to have a standardized testing distance. And we have decided that will be 100 centimeters. 
And so at 100 centimeters, in this case, it drops 10 centimeters vertically. That defines a 10 diopter prism. And it only counts at 100 centimeters. So if I told you that at 50 centimeters, it drops 5 centimeters, it's still a 10 prism diopter prism because 50 centimeters doesn't count. You got to take it on out to 100 and that's going to give you 10 centimeters. See? Now, what if I told you this? At 200 centimeters, it drops 20 centimeters. It's still a 10 diopter prism, as you can see here. These are very easy questions to write, so don't miss questions on the definition of prism diopters. Want to do an experiment? Okay, to do this experiment, we have pulled out, for your viewing pleasure, the 1899 corneal surface microscope. This was invented by Siegfried Kapsky, who worked with Carl Zeiss. And as you can see, uh, this is just a microscope. It's got 10x oculars on it here. Uh, this particular one was made uh, by Bausch & Lomb probably about 1900. And if you've ever used those portable slit lamps that we use today, um, you know that the light source is separate from the uh, viewing part, and that's kind of what they did back then. It wasn't until about 1916 that it all got put together into a slit lamp, and that was done with uh, Alvar Goldstrand and Carl Zeiss. As you can see right behind it, I have a reference sheet taped to my wall. If you tape things to your wall, I recommend using painter's tape. That way it doesn't leave a mark. And you can see that I've got uh, it marked from zero down to 25 centimeters. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a laser and we're going to set it uh, right up here on top so that it's mounted onto our corneal microscope. It makes a pretty nice base for that. And we're going to put it at 100 centimeters that uh, I've got marked off here and we're going to shoot it at this target and then we're going to put a prism of unknown power in front of that laser and see what the vertical deviation is. So let's get to it. So now I have everything set up. I've got my cornea microscope back here at 100 centimeters with my laser pointer and we are ready to go. So we're going to test fire the laser here to make sure that we're on zero and that looks good. So I have my prism of unknown prismatic power and I'm now putting it in front of it to see what the vertical drop is. And you can see 20 centimeters. That defines a 20 prism diopter prism. Tell you what, let's put this whole complex up to 50 centimeters away from the target. So up from 100 to 50. And let's see what happens with that. So now I'm 50 centimeters away. I'm going to test fire my laser to make sure that I am appropriately on zero. And now I'm going to take this 20 prism diopter prism and put it in front. How far do you think it's going to drop? Hopefully you already know, but let's see if the physics bear it out. Boom, right there. Goes down 10 centimeters when 50 centimeters away. Now, it's important to realize that this does not make it a 10 prism diopter prism. The only thing that counts is the vertical deviation at 100 centimeters. And back at 100 centimeters, this prism dropped at 20. So it is a 20 prism diopter prism no matter how close to the target we get it. That's an important concept. So to help you understand prisms in more depth, we have some prism rules here that are really going to be clinically useful, which I've modestly named Wiggins prism rules. So rule number one is that the rays will always bend towards the base. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So once again, we have our target here, but you can see I've added an A and a B to it. And we're going to test the validity of prism rule number one that the rays bend towards the base. And so to do that, I'm going to take, uh, once again, our trusty 20 prism diopter prism, and it doesn't really matter uh, where this starts. We'll start it right here, uh, about two and a half. That doesn't matter. I'm going to take this prism base towards B and apex towards A, and we'll see which way it moves. According to rule one, it should move towards the base. So here we go, putting it in front of it now. So you can see that that dot with the base towards B moves towards the base. If I rotate it around such that the apex is towards B and the base is towards A, I'm now moving here. And same thing, if I put it base up, that dot should move up. And yes, the physics bear that out. And just for completion, base down was down there somewhere. And it doesn't matter uh, the vertical drop on that because I'm not at 100 centimeters. But rule number one, rays go to base. 
And once again, this is why rule number one is in effect. As you can see, all the rays bend towards the base. So let's do another experiment. So now we're going to discover rule number two. And I'm not going to tell you exactly what that rule says just yet. I think you're going to find that out on your own. So what I need you to do is to grab a loose prism. Uh, 10 would be good. 20 is just fine. And you can't use a laser pointer for this. You're going to have to use a muscle light or maybe an indirect as your light source so that you don't hurt yourself. And what I want you to do is I want you to take that light and look into it. So shine the light at your eyes and then take the prism and move it between you and the light source such that you're now looking at the light source through the prism and which way does it move? So put me on pause and uh, put that base in different locations and see which way the light source that you're seeing through the prism moves. So hopefully what you discovered was rule number two, which says that images go towards the apex. So wherever you had the apex of that prism as you rotated it around, hopefully that light moved towards the apex. And here's why that works. Now in our first experiment where we were looking at uh, rule number one, we were just shining the laser at the wall and then we were putting the prism in front of the laser and then we were looking at the wall. We were never looking through the prism. But for rule number two experiment, we are the patient looking through the prism. And so we were looking at that light source and although the rays do bend towards the base, rule number one still works. From our point of view, looking through that prism, the, the image goes towards the apex because of the way the rays are bending. So that is rule number two. Okay, another experiment. I'd like you to take uh, your prism and grab a buddy, uh, hopefully not an unsuspecting buddy, and then I want you to hold it base out and do alternate cover with that prism. And ideally you would pick someone that does not have strabismus. Just find someone that's ortho, hopefully they're nearby. Put that prism over, say, the right eye, base out, and then do alternate cover or cross cover, whatever you want to call it, and see what happens. Put me on pause. So if you used enough prism and did cross cover, your friend with it base out over the right eye would look like they had exotropia. And that's because the eye wants to go wherever you put that base. So base out you made that eye go out and that is exotropia. So here are all three rules together. The rays go to the base, images go to the apex, and the eye goes to the base. Now, why does that help us at all? Because if I have someone with exotropia, their eye is swinging out and I want that eye to come in, which way do I orient the base over that eye? I put it base in because I want the eye that's out to move in and the eye will follow wherever I put the base. So that's how I orient it. Now, what if they have a right hyper? Strabismus is when the eyes are not in the same position. It's not necessarily that the eyes are straight ahead, but it's a difference in the position of the eyes. And the goal of strabismus treatment is generally to get both eyes in the same position. So if I have a right hyper, if the right eye is higher than the left, and I want to treat it with a prism over the right eye, I can take a base down prism over the right eye and take that elevated right eye and move it down to where the left eye is. Now what if I have a right hyper, but I want to fix it with a prism over the left eye? Again, to fix strabismus, we're generally trying to get both eyes in the same position. So if my left eye is lower than my right eye, I'm going to put a base up prism over my left eye, and then the left eye will jump up there to where the right eye is, and strabismus fixed, at least as long as the prism's there. So with this understanding, you should hopefully never really have to question, how do I orient the prism? Because you just put the base of that prism where you want the eye to go. This wonderful creation is called Tachos. I just discovered this a couple years ago. It wasn't my discovery. It was at a, a local, uh, well, let's call it a restaurant. But you can see here, uh, barbecue on top of tater tots. Oh my goodness. Tachos. Let me tell you. 
So that's all we have for this first part of Prisms. Please come back and enjoy Prisms Part 2, where we're going to go into a very high-yield topic called Prentice's Rule. I'll see you then. Thank you, and have a great day.